Um, I'm going to be talking on a project that was initiated a couple of years ago um, by Greg Martindale, who at that time was a manager of the Biodiversity Stewardship Unit, mm -hmm. and myself. Um, his, he is a co-author of the paper, but I just want to say at this point that he hasn't seen the final version at all, so any mistakes or bad bits are entirely my responsibility. Um, we obviously in stewardship, biodiversity is a is a, a really important um, aspect, and we needed to find ways of measuring for diversity in in stewardship sites. So you give this one. Um, Grassland studies have always concentrated on the grass species because of the importance in animal production. But actually, forbs are by far the most diverse part of grasslands. Um, they make up less of the phytomass than grasses do, but much more of the species richness. Um, high plant diversity is really necessary to maintain ecosystem services. And KwaZulu Natal Music, that um, high rainfall grasslands, have amongst the highest reported rates of forb species depletion when there's heavy grazing. Um, so we felt very strongly that they should be measured routinely to measure the effect of grazing. Um, just quickly for those of you who are not botanist ecologists here, Forbes is a very odd word um, and I thought I might just explain it quickly. They are what we call the mega diverse component of most grasslands. Forbes are everything that is not a grass or a sedge or a rush or a fern. So they are the flowering plants including, well, including the petaloid monocots but excluding the grasses and the sedges. Um, the word forb, which is a really unusual word, comes from the Greek word for pasture or fodder. So why it's come to be applied to the non-grasses is a bit of a mystery, but that's obviously happened over the last two and a half thousand years. Uh, and just as a matter of interest, that painting was done in 1503 by a very famous artist, and it captures exactly what you feel like when you're counting forbs with your head at ground level on your hands and knees. Um, the KZN mm. high rainfall or music grasslands are quite unique. Um, they're made up primarily of tufted south of grasses, which have a very low nutrient availability during the winter months. Um, they experience a high rainfall in the growing season and frequent fires in the dry seasons. Um, this is very much out at the jury stage, but there's a lot of belief now that there, there was not intensive grazing by bulk mega herbivores historically before the advent of cattle. Um, they're made up mainly of very long-lived forbs and grasses that have a huge amount of underground biomass and this allows them to adapt to very dry, cold winters and the fires. Because of this, they've got a limited capacity to recover from disturbance. Um, the grasslands have been highly transformed by agriculture, forestry, and urban sprawl. The remaining areas are under huge threat from yeah. overgrazing. Um, and little of these grasslands are conserved outside of the Drakensberg. Sorry, Kevin, why do I keep this? There we go. Um, these are just some pictures of grassland forb species that have been excavated. Um, and you can see the enormous amount of root mass there. They go down for considerable distances. A lot of them have got we call lignotubers. Um, some have got big bulbs. And these are obviously very long-lived plants that are not easily replaced. Um, because of the importance of measuring forb diversity, we started to measure it in about 2008 in the biodiversity grassland sites. We obviously only wanted to select 
sites that had high biodiversity value. Um, so at the beginning, we did one or four diversity measurements to decide whether the sites were conservation worthy or not. We used the method developed by Rob Scott Shaw of KZM Wildlife, which basically used 16 one meter subplots inside a 100 meter square. Um, and the results of that you can use to calculate various um, measures of species richness, species abundance, and evenness. Um, he then used a combination of these scores to give a grassland importance score, grassland condition index, <coughs> um, which ranged from naught, which was basically a completely degraded grassland, up to five, which was a pristine grassland in very good condition. Um, the cutoff point was three. So this is what a grassland in condition five would look like. Full of forbs, very good basal cover, um, not much grazing or disturbance experience there. Um, the site at the bottom is a grassland with probably a condition score of one, very low basal cover, a lot of alien invasive weeds like Ricardia, um, very, very low forb diversity. Um, this is, these are a lot of the sites we looked at. Um, between 2008 and 2010. Obviously, we were looking at fairly good grasslands because they had been selected for biodiversity stewardship. Um, these surveys confirmed what we thought. Most sites, with the exception of two, were three or above. Um, and it was quite nice to have a slightly quantitative measure to say, you know, this is worth making into a biodiversity stewardship nature reserve because the grasslands are in good condition. Um, post 2010-11, we started getting concerned because a lot of the stewardship sites actually had commercial grazing on them. There are very few areas in the, mid, in the Natal music grasslands that, that are not grazed. Um, and if we excluded it completely, there would be no stewardship sites or very few. And we were very keen to see the relationship between forb diversity and grazing. Um, <clears throat> I did a quick sum, and approximately 46% of stewardship sites in KZN are commercially grazed by livestock. A further 10% have got pretty uncontrolled community and cattle grazing them, a lot of the, the sappy and mondi grassland patches, and a further 9% have game species grazing them, either controlled or uncontrolled. Um, there's very little scientific understanding of the drivers of loss of diversity associated with livestock grazing, especially in our grasslands. It's a really critical issue for biodiversity stewardship sites, so we, with Greg's um, in encouragement, we started this long-term monitoring program. And obviously the results of this will influence the management recommendations. Um, up till now, there's been a limited amount of research on forb diversity and its relation to grazing in KZN. Um, Petros and Gwenya, who published a paper in 2012, <coughs> looked at very low... Um, rangeland or felt condition scores and very high ones and found that there was no clear relationship between them. He was hoping to be able to say that you could use felt condition scores as a measure of forb diversity, but that wasn't the case. Um, and then in 2014, Craig Morris and Rob Scott Shaw um, published a paper showing that intensive grazing resulted in massively depleted forb diversity. Um, and uh, several other st um, studies have also indicated that intensive grazing impacts quite negatively on forb diversity. Um, when we started the, pro the project, we obviously selected biodiversity stewardship sites with managed livestock grazing for this long-term monitoring. <clears throat> we carried out forb and range and condition measurements at exactly the same fixed sites so they can be revisited. Um, and we plan to repeat these measurements approximately every five year, years, which is 
the minimum time that one can see changes under general management conditions. Um, these four diversity assessments are very time consuming, so we could only deal with a limited number of sites. Um, this is their distribution through the Mesic grasslands and KZN, mainly in Midlands, Mistbelt, or Moy River, Highland, Sourfelt um, grasslands. We've done the red sites, the yellow sites, Namalanga and Amgana. We've done some preliminary work, but we um, need to go back, and we were due to go back this season, but it's been so dry that we're not doing any surveys so far. Um, in order to get the methods, we had a meeting with a lot of the KSDN wildlife grassland experts in 2012, and there was a lot of discussion. We ended up deciding to carry on using the method that we had been using. Um, again, all the plants in a 100 meter, in subplots within a 100 meter plot um, were recorded, but we also recorded all additional species within this plot that weren't in the subplots, plus the species within a further um, 20 by 20 meter plots which included this. Uh, that's just a picture of us doing a full diversity on the side of a mountain at Mpempe. The range and condition assessments, we used the methods of CAMP and we had huge assistance from the Sadara folk with these. They basically taught us how to do them and came along with us on most of them, which uh, was quite reassuring because identifying grasses when they aren't flowering is quite challenging at first. Um, we then wrote the range and condition reports and the management recommendations and discussed these with the landowners um, based on the surveys. And in the stewardship sites, we have regular follow-up meetings, at least annually, with the landowners to see whether they are um, sticking with the management recommendations and if they're not, why they're not. So we actually have a very good record of grazing and burning in these sites. Um, that's just a picture of us doing range and condition assessments at Gainey Flay, I think it was. Um, some very preliminary results that I haven't done any complicated stats on. Um, most of our range and condition, because we selected sites that were in reasonable condition, <laughs> ranged from 40 to about 90 percent. Um, there was really no clear relationship within this range between either species richness in the plots or between the diversity index. There was a vague sort of curvy linear response, but there certainly wasn't a linear response. But from what one can tell, such a small sample size so far, the, the highest for diversity seemed to occur between about 60 and 90 percent felt conditions. So until we've got more data and analyzed this further, it seems that if we can keep the felt condition within the sort of 60, 90 um, percent range, it should be good for the Forbes. It's quite bizarre that at very high felt condition assessments, which are often very dominated by Thermida, the Forbes diversity seems to drop a bit. Um, and this has been picked up in quite a lot of studies. You'd obviously expect it to be low at the, at the, at the very low range condition areas, but it, you would expect a linear relations where it went up and up, but it doesn't do that. Um, and this is interestingly very similar to the results of Nguenya, who found he didn't measure the, the sort of middle ranges, unfortunately, but he's coming up with quite a similar result and Scott Shaw and Morris's results in misspelled grass and sandstone seems to behave differently. Um, are also showing this slightly curvy linear relationship. So it is quite reassuring that we are getting a similar sort of trend from our results. Um, so what I've already reported, most of the plots were found to be in reasonable to good range and condition. We didn't find a direct linear relationship between them. 
um, and they seem to be highest within that range. Thank you. So the conclusions and the summing up is the program was developed by the biodiversity stewardship with NGO partners and with huge help from the Department of Agriculture at Sadara. Um, the advantage of this program is that linking the monitoring program to stewardship provides us with the opportunity to develop long-term reliable data set. Um, and we've got a relationship with the owners and managers of the sites so we can have quite a say in the interventions and the, the management recommendations. Um, we making quite an effort to partner with UKZ in um, range grassland science it is now um, and people like Craig Morris and Kevin Kirkman have been really helpful um, but we are quite concerned about the long-term funding and expertise because it is quite detailed work that needs to be done and people do need a sort of basic knowledge of botany and it's we feel that it's really important that this project is expanded and kind of entrenched so that we can get some long-term results um, because there have been a lot of one-off studies but this I think is going to be really valuable in that we can measure exactly what the grazing regime has been and the effect on food <coughs> diversity. Um, so thank you very much for listening to that. Um, just to say thank you very much to CEPF who certainly funded my part of the work in this project. Um, and we were able to work in a lot of stewardship sites because of their funding. And thanks to Greg for getting it going. Thank you.